My name is Soros, and those of you in Singapore might know that I'm a Node developer and I'm active in the local Singapore JS community. Right now, I'm finishing my study in the National University of Singapore, and today I'm going to talk about web framework architecture and also my project Quiver. Now, be before I begin, I believe some of you in the audience might think of this no way, not another web framework. And you are rightfully so, because we all share the same frustration that there have been too many web frameworks around, with new ones still being created almost every day. But I also like to take this as an opportunity for us to think a bit deeper on why do we use frameworks, why are there so many of them, what are their problems, and is there any better ways to create web applications? I believe most of us here, in some way, one way or another, will have chosen a particular web framework to help us build our web application. And there can be many reasons behind our choice, but in general, we choose a framework because it is easy to use, and also it seems to solve all our problems. There's also a high chance that the framework we chose would be what's called an MVC framework. And we know, all know what is an MVC pattern. And in fact, the MVC pattern is so prominent today in our generation that it seems to be the answer to everything, but also the source of all hatred. I always wondered that if the MVC pattern is so great and so elegant, why are there so many different MVC implementations, each having the um, MVC implementation that incompatible with each other's. To understand that, let's take a quick recap on what is model, view, and controller. The MVC is a very simple pattern that makes, us, makes it very easy for us to solve certain problem domains. For example, it lets us group database persistent logic, such as SQL queries, to the model domain, and also the presentation logic, such as templating, to the view domain. Even though MVC is a very simple pattern, the real world is much co more complicated than that, and, and the problems cannot be just fit into just three categories. In fact, there are many other problems that, there are many other problems that do not fall into a scope of MVC, and there's no clear consensus on how we can solve these problems. And this is usually where web frameworks diverge, and they will solve these problems in non-standard ways and sell these as a features of their frameworks. And as developers, it becomes that we choose a framework based on the feature list to suit our needs, and the name MVC is just there as a distraction for us to obscure the fact that we are choosing the features. Our current application and framework design also do not fit well in the modern web architecture. Today, with advanced in cloud computing, we can have thousands of server instances running on the cloud. And of these instances, there are many other application types on top of our core applications, such as the database server, our main cache server, or Redis. And all these other applications, they can be scaled independently in different ways. But at the core, most of our code are still reside on the main application, which is designed as if they are running as a, mono, as a single piece of software on, a, on one server, like in the 90 eras. And the only way to scale this is by scaling them horizontally with many instances of the application server running the same code. Now, while this solves the problem, there should be better way to scale the core of our main application, for example, by breaking them down to smaller subsystems. 
Sometimes this concept is also called microservices. But we cannot achieve that level of modularity if our core application is designed as a monolithic piece of software. Now, MVC is a great pattern, and I'm not suggesting that we should abandon MVC. But we have to also think beyond MVC and go down to the architecture level so that we can find a generic architecture that can be applied the same way to all the problem domain we face while keeping our application modular. And the middleware architecture is the solution that I would like to highlight today. If you search the internet, there are many vague definitions on what a middleware really is. But I find the definition I've shown here to fit the, fit the best. And here is how it works. At the core of a middleware architecture, it is made of an application which can be a function or an object or a program that performs some standard operation, such as handling HTTP requests. And, and with that, we can have a middleware that wraps around an application which can intercept the input and output of this application to modify its behavior. For example, a middleware can modify the request before the application receives it, as well as changing the response that is returned by an application. A middleware can also capture any error raised by the application and recover, it from, recover from it by generating its own response. We can have many layers of middlewares each wrapped around another to form a, a complex application. And this is a very powerful construct that is often hidden in plain sight beneath many of the web applications we use today. It is common that in our applications, features such as HTTP compression and session management are implemented as middleware. In fact, middleware is the universal architecture that can be found across many different languages and platforms. At a low level of HTTP servers such as Apache and Nginx, they have their own middleware system that is also sometimes called filters. In Python, there's this standard called the Web Server Gateway Interface, or WSGI in short, that allow Python applications to have a universal way to interface with the web servers. There's also a similar interface in Ruby, which is called REC, that allow Ruby applications and frameworks, including Rails, to run on top of it. The WSGI and REC standards, they also enable a power, the powerful middleware architecture. They allow web applications on top to use the same middleware, regardless of the particular framework they choose. Now, so middleware is a powerful way to extend web applications. However, there's a high barrier in implementing and using middlewares properly today as compared to just simply writing code using a high-level framework. This is because the current middleware standards are quite low-level. For instance, the WSGI and REC standard, they are modeled after the CGI standard which is invented in the 1990s. And as for the Apache and Nginx, the middleware implementation have to be written in C, require compiler toolchain, and sometimes even root access just to change the configuration. To take middleware to its full potential, we have to break this barrier and allow middleware to be used easily at all levels. And this is where Node comes to rescue. Ever since Ryan Dow invented Node, Node has an important advantage that Node itself is already the web server. With the powerful libuv library 
that allow Node to perform asynchronous I.O. operation, and the natural asynchronous programming style in JavaScript. Node itself can be run as a powerful, high-performance web server without the help of conventional servers such as Apache. Node also, by default, comes with a standard handler interface, which is defined as a, simply as a plain function. And all the HTTP and application code can be run in the same environment, namely in JavaScript. So since Node have all this advantage, we as a Node developers should live a happily after life, right? Unfortunately, not so simple because there are still some weaknesses in the current node handler design. And we can demonstrate that by having a grid handler example, that having a handler that grids the user with a configurable grid work. Now, because of the lack of a dependency management solution in node, anything that needs configuration usually have to get the configuration from a global location. And that makes it hard to separate the application in, into a different configuration environment. The, dependent, the, the intermediary result stored by middleware, such as a user information, also have be, to be mixed with the request object because there is no other way for a middleware to pass down intermediary information to the handler. And this makes the request object complicated and hard to understand. At the core of this code, the actual application logic is actually made of just one line of code, which is constructing the string that greets the user. And the remaining lines are just boilerplates that contain HTTP-specific logic for returning the response. And to generate the response, the code, handler code have to perform imperative action to the response object. And all this together makes it quite hard to implement a middleware architecture on top of node handler. For example, if you want to implement a GZIP middleware that compress a HTTP response generated by a node handler, how can we do it? We can use the current express middleware standard, which is a middleware system in node, and by having, defining a middleware function with an additional next parameter. And the first step of this middleware is straightforward, which is to check the accept encoding header in the request. This is because the request header information is already available by the time this middleware function is called. But the next step is not so straightforward because this middleware, it has to set the content encoding response header of the response, as well as compressing the response stream. But the response result is not yet been written by the handler because it's not yet been called. And even when it's called, the handler would write its result to the response object directly. As a result, the middleware has to resort to some ugly hacks in order to work around this and somehow intercept the content before it is actually written. The next function is also an opaque function with no clear semantics of where the middleware is going next. This makes it hard for middleware to perform some uncommon operations, such as calling the original handler twice, or such as error recovery, which the middleware will have to check whether the response have been written halfway when the error was thrown. So one obje main objective for me to create Quiver is to implement an easy to use middleware-based middleware architecture and try to apply this middleware concept to everything, including application logic such as permission control. On top of this, Quiver also comes with many other features that makes it even easier to create web applications. It uses the ECMAScript 6, which is the next JavaScript standard, and it has a, its own stream design following the CSP style. 
Quiver has a dependency management solution built in, and also it has a powerful declarative component system. I'll go through each one of them, and eventually you, you can create an application using Quiver, structure something like the one I've shown here, and I'll explain how it works in the end. At the foundation, Quiver is made of six foundation constructs, which I will go through each of them now, from the, starting from the bottom. First thing, Quiver has its own stream implementation to fix some of the existing problems in the no existing node stream. Instead of following the current stream design, the Quiver stream channel follows this communication sequential process model, or CSP in short, that is invented by Tony Hall to manage concurrent process. This channel concept is also similar to the channel construct in Golang, for those of you who are familiar with it. Quiver stream channel is also have a promise-based control flow, and more importantly, it has back pressure support. Let's see how we can create a file rate stream using a Quiver stream. The first thing in a function, it will use the Quiver channel constructor to create a pair of read-write stream and then return the read stream to the caller. The function also keeps the write stream private to itself. And it, would, it can then asynchronously read the buffer from a file system and simply writes it to the write stream, which then the buffer can be automatically delivered to the read stream. The Quiver stream channel design makes it very easy to perform stream transformation, which is a very hard task in the current node stream design. For example, to implement a transform stream function that modifies the stream buffer content, the function can accept a read stream object, create a pair of new read write stream, and return the new read stream to the caller. It can then perform this pipe transform operation in the background by continuously reading the buffer from the read stream, perform some transformation, and then just write it back to the new write stream. And the above code demonstrates how this pipe transform works. First of all, Quiver also provides this ES6 generator wrapper function to allow us to write asynchronous code in synchronous fashion using the ES6 generator with an additional U keyword to asynchronous function calls. This allows the code piping code to simply implement it in a while loop, and the piping can optionally support back pressure by calling the write stream prepare write method. This would suspend the code until the purple read stream at the other end is ready to be read. Both the prepare write and read method of the streams also return their result as promises containing object with the structured result. Inside one of these result is the close flag, which is used to indicate the end of either stream, which then the piping can stop. With this new stream, Quiver also split the original handler def definition into two new types of handlers. The first type of handlers is called a stream handler, which is used to implement code that contain only application logic. And if your application code contain HTTP logic as well, you can use the more complicated version, which is the HTTP handler. The stream handler also accepts an arcs plane object in addition to the input stream to allow, to allow middlewares to, to put in intermediary results. And as for the HTTP handler, it also ha separate out the request and response head 
from the body so as to allow easier manipulation by middlewares. You will also notice that both the handlers, they accept and return what's called a streamable object in Quiver. And a streamable is essentially a stream-like object with a two-stream method to convert the stream streamable into a read stream. But the streamable can also have other optional methods such as to text and to JSON to allow it to convert to other representation in optimized way without the overhead of parsing the entire raw stream content. Here we call the conversion from a streamable to string to be to text to avoid name collision with the built-in JavaScript to string method. Here is a simple example of how we can implement a hello handler in Quiver. The intermediary result of this handler is, is retrieved from the arc spring object. And once constructing the string, the handler can use the text to streamable helper function to convert any string to a streamable object and then simply return it. And the stream, and the stream handler design in Quiver follow closely with the Unix process model, which allow Quiver to take full advantage of the Unix philosophy and things such as Unix pipeline. Next, the HDB handler can also be implemented in similar ways. And here is an example of HTTP handler passing from post data. And notice in the last line, to create a response, the HTTP handler returns its result as a two element array, with the first element being the response head, which can be created just like any ordinary object. And the second argument, we call the empty streamable helper function to create an empty body for the response. On top of handlers, Quiver also have a simple solution to solve the dependency management problem. Using the cons builder construct, a builder is simply a function that accepts a config plane object and return a handler function. And using that, a, a builder can capture configurations such as a grid word in this case, and then return a function that can then capture the grid word in the form of closure variable access. On top of this, Quiver have this filter construct which implements the middleware pattern that I described earlier. And a filter has a similar signature as builder that it accepts a config plain object as first argument, so as to make the filter configurable, but also the original handler as a second argument. The filter function then returns a filtered handler function that wraps the original hand handler inside. Using that, we can perform tasks such as permission control, which then would check whether the user is administrator and if it's passed, it will just simply forward the request to the handler by calling it as a function call. The Quiver filter design is, is made to allow maximum control of the filter on all the behaviors of handlers. And with that, we can easily implement a filters such as the HTTP compressed filter that we described earlier. Inside here, our, HTTP, our compression filter would as usual to check the accept encoding request header. And the, for the next step, it will call the original handler and get back its result as a two element array containing the response. And because this response head and response stream, they are just plain object that has been, not been written to the wire, a HDB filter can perform, modify the response head 
such as adding the content encoding header to it with no further complication. It can also compress the response body by creating a new streamable out of it. And when returning, it will replace the response body with this new streamable while keeping the response head the same. Now the Quiver filter implements the middleware pattern that I described. And the reason it's called filter is because Quiver middleware is something a bit more powerful. By adding one extra word to the definition, a Quiver middleware is a function that accepts a configuration and the, or the, the original handler builder as a second argument. And this allows the middleware to not only extend the behavior of the constructed handler, but also affect how the handler itself is constructed. And with that, we can build middleware such as the database middleware, which would then extract database credentials from the config, instantiate a database instance, and then inject it back to the config, config object before passing it to the original builder function. This is essentially dependency injection solved in Quiver. And the advantage of this approach is twofold. At a builder, a builder function implementer can just make use of the database instance directly without knowing how to instantiate it. And as for the and as for the caller, it can just pass in the raw database credentials without having to boil it down to the database construction code. All these I have described are the foundation constructs in Quiver. And on top of it, there's a component system to provide an easy way to declare these constructs as components and combine them easily. For example, here we can use the Quiver component system to create a simplified type of handler using this simple handler builder function provided. And it allows the simplified handler type to accept and return simplified objects such as string and JSON that is automatically converted from streamables. In this case, we are defining a grid handler component. And because it ignores the input stream, the input type is void. And because it returns the result as string, the output type is text. The entire expression returns a handler component, which can then be used later on. And the reason we call it grid handler instead of grid handler component is for simplicity in naming. Once we define a component, we can easily instantiate them by using the load handler method on the component. This would return a handler function that can later be consumed by simply use it as a function call. And this has an important implication, which is that Quiver handlers, both the stream and HTTP handlers, can be consumed internally without the requirement of network. And this makes it very easy for us to unit test it, as well as for allow the handlers to have dependencies on each other. Once we have multiple components defined, we can combine them easily using the component system. Let's say we have a permission filter defined in some other source file. We can then simply import them and apply it to the grid handler component by calling the middleware method. This extended grid handler can also be mounted on a newly created router component, which would then extract the name out from the parameterized URL. A, hand, a component can simply be run as a server by calling this start server helper function. 
And using Quiver, we can create very complex application by forming component graphs consists of hundreds of components. And in your typical setting, we would have a main router component as an entry point to handle all HTTP requests. The main router can also forward some sub-routes to a sub-router for handling. And at the end, we can have handlers such as user info handler to, to serve user profiles in JSON format. The user info handler can depend on database, and it can have the database middleware to inject this dependency. Let's say we have an app view post handler that serves blog post content. This view post handler might want to check for permission to allow only certain readers to read, and it can be done by using a permission filter. And for this permission filter to get the user information before deciding, it can have direct dependency to the user info handler itself and consume it just like a REST API. The main router can also have other paths such as serving images, and usually we want to resize images before serving to save some bandwidth. And this can be done by having a pipeline handler. Inside this pipeline, the first component would get the file, the image file from some source such as a file handler. And the content would be resized by forwarding it to an image resize handler. And because image resizing is an expensive operation, the entire result can be cached using a cache filter so that the image only needs to be resized once. And a common HTTP filter can be applied on the main router and it will affect all the sub handler components inside. The Quiver component system also makes it very easy to plug and play, replace a component. For example, because image resizing is very expensive, we can offload it to some external server and replace the original resizing with a proxy component. So in summary, we learned that middleware is the universal architecture that can be found in many platforms. And Quiver want to take this middleware concept to the next level by applying it to all, to everything, including application logic. With Node, Quiver also blur the boundary between HTTP and application code and allow them to all live in the same system. Right now, I finished the foundation architecture of Quiver and also the component system to allow defining components. The next step is to implement core components that provide features that are commonly found in web applications, such as templating and authentication. It is only after all these components have been done, then only we can create, easily create web applications by simply combining these components. I've only shared about Quiver to the local Singapore community. And right now, I would like to take this as a chance to have a beta launch at JSCon. So do help me spread the word on the internet. Any feedback and contribution is welcome. And if you are really interested in my architecture, do join me as a core developer so that we can together take Quiver to the next step. Thank you very much. <laughs>